You're listening to the Asia Geopolitics Podcast. I'm your host, Katie Putz, recording in Washington, D.C. And this is Ankit Panda, also in Washington, D.C. Good to be back with you, Katie. How are you doing, Ankit? Doing well. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's it's been a wild July, I think, in the United States. Uh, you know, between heat waves, we have had one attempted assassination of former President Donald Trump during a rally in Pennsylvania, July 13th. And then a couple days later, his presumptive opponent, Joe Biden, President Joe Biden, dropped out of the race following a poor debate performance and mounting pressure within the Democratic Party. Uh, Biden quickly endorsed his vice president, Kamala Harris, for the Democratic Party's nomination. Prominent party leaders followed suit. She's expected to become the formal nominee next month in August after the Democratic Party convention in Chicago. Uh, so after that, it's really off to the races. So we thought that An Ankit and I thought that it was a good time for us to discuss the U.S. presidential election. You know, it was certainly being watched around the world before July, uh, but it's arguably a new game now. We have a new face heading the Democratic ticket, and the Republican ticket is fully set with the naming of Ohio Senator J.D. Vance as Trump's running mate during the Republican Party convention in July. So for our purposes here at Asia Ge Geopolitics, of course, Anka and I wanted to dive into how Asia feels about this election and a little about what we expect from the candidates on the foreign policy front uh, as the election really starts to get going. So Anka, with, with that prelude, you know, an often repeated mantra is that Asian leaders are anxious in regard to U.S. commitment to the Indo-Pacific, U.S. allies in particular. Uh, how are these countries viewing the state of the U.S. election at this point? Yeah, so, you know, big question. Asia's a big place. But I think in general terms, I think anxiety is, is a good way to frame it. Uh, but it also kind of smooths over, I think, the complexity that I think lingers for certain countries, probably less the allies and more the adversaries and certain partner countries. You know, India, I think, is a pretty interesting case here that we can maybe talk about a little more. But, you know, from the perspective of allies, adversaries and partners alike, I think the way to frame the stakes in this election is, you know, a consistent, predictable United States is something of a load bearing structure for regional order in the Indo-Pacific, uh, having a United States that you know, pledges fealty to certain norms, be that, you know, freedom of navigation or, or non-proliferation or maintaining a forward deployed capability to deter uh, conflicts, to respond to crises and contingencies. That's something that Asian countries have been used to, um, uh, certainly in the post-Cold War context. And so the stakes in this election, I think, are rather apparent from that perspective, because obviously the two tickets have a fairly divergent view of the U.S. role in the world. Now, I will say... Um, you know, if this was a European geopolitics podcast, I think we would potentially have to make a, you know, put a finer point on this, because I think, especially on the Republican side of the aisle, uh, the Trump Vance ticket, I think, has substantially greater misgivings about Europe, uh, per se, than it does about Asia. But again, that's complex, too. I mean, just in the broader sense of allies here, I think um, the sense that I've gotten on my recent trips to the region and engagements with Asian officials there is a sense that the United States, even if the Trump Vance ticket wins, will need Asia quite a bit more because Trump and Vance continue to, of course, um, stake out a fairly hawkish position towards China, which remains uh, really an area of bipartisan agreement between the two parties, but with um, differences in how that policy might be implemented. But there isn't really the kind of um, talk that you really see about Europe, where you know Vance notably has been uh, probably the member of the Senate that uh, is is certainly in favor of the United States walking away from Ukraine, forcing Zelensky to sue for peace. Now, of course, that's not viewed favorably in Asia, particularly among countries like, uh, you know, Japan, Australia, uh, partner states that have been rather forcefully in support of the U.S. policy towards uh, Ukraine. But it does um, it doesn't necessarily accompany broader baggage about what the United States might do vis-a-vis -vis its allies. Now, there's exceptions to this, right? We talked about South Korea recently, where you know, increasingly in South Korea, uh, it's not uncommon to hear the view that if if Trump and Vance are elected, South Korea is going to have to build nuclear weapons or that the alliance will not survive. Again, you know, a lot of practical questions there. But the anxieties, I, I do think, are real. Now, Kamala Harris, um, interesting from the perspective of Asia in many ways. You know, as vice president, she has traveled to Asia four times. She's actually met Xi Jinping, which is pretty interesting, uh, given that, um, you know, it's not the protocol arrangement you'd expect. Uh, you know, Biden had met Xi when he was vice president, so it's somewhat unusual that Kamala would have met um, Xi Jinping, given that uh, you know she's the incumbent vice president. 
But uh, also, she's met the incumbent Taiwanese president, uh, Lai ching te She's met uh, Kishida in Japan, Ferdinand Marcos Jr. So having these personal relationships, I do think, uh, gives a certain sense of familiarity to foreign leaders and governments. But, you know, the broader picture here, I think, is that Harris represents continuity uh, in broad strokes. Um, mm -hmm. But the continuity also raises certain anxieties, right? Because I think many allies in the region would love to see a United States or a U.S. president that was able to make the case, as Obama did, for instance, for trade liberalization in the region. Harris mm -hmm. won't do that, right? She's not going to uh, flip the script on the Indo-Pacific economic framework, um, bring the United States back into the Trans-Pacific Partnership or anything like that. But, uh, you know, Harris, in a way, would represent stability. So if I had to guess, I mean, from the perspective of the allies, right, a Harris administration would be preferable from the sense of maintaining continuity, allowing a lot of the initiatives that have now been in, um, that have now started under the Biden administration to continue and evolve, you know, things like trilateral cooperation between Japan and South Korea, AUKUS, all of that, I think, kind of remains on the rails uh, if Harris were to prevail in the election. Yeah, no, I think that's a very good point. And it is worth sort of diving a little bit into Harris's, the, the differences in experience really between Harris uh, and, and and Trump when it comes to Asia. Um, obviously, Donald Trump was president and had plenty of engagements in Asia, not all of them extremely positive. Um, and on the other hand, Harris has represented the United States at the ASEAN summit and the East Asia summit in 2023. Joe Biden didn't go. Uh, Kamala Harris did. She's met with the the heads of all of the U.S. treaty allies in Asia. So Japan, South Korea, the Philippines, Australia and Thailand. And so I, I think, you know, your point on continuity is well taken. Um, and, and a question that I have is, you know, you mentioned sort of that we can't really expect Kamala Harris to kind of make a u-turn on some of the trade liberalization issues and sort of the the free trade agreement front um but we can't really see that happening in the donald trump administration e either or second donald trump administration so maybe we should kind of dive into donald trump and, and his engagements in asia and what we can expect and I, I think one of the things that we can expect is that it's hard to predict what could happen i mean i think uh his engagements with north korea are a perfect um, back a story uh, in in that regard. Yeah, so you know, I think I think that's exactly the right place to start, which is that you know Trump is capricious, he is unpredictable, and I think the insight about a second Trump administration, broadly speaking, is that you know this time it won't be staffed with some of the more traditional Republican national security figures that were in the first Trump administration that sort of kept. Trump, if not on the rails, then at least within the guardrails of a, a general foreign policy approach that didn't result in the termination of treaty alliances or the United States doing something uh, completely brash. But, you know, we, we did see things like the Trump-Kim summits, uh, which were very much kind of not focused on non-proliferation ends, but more on kind of the, the spectacle of it all, you know, demanding mm -hmm. $5 billion from South Korea and cost-sharing talks, uh, so on and so forth. So I think the anxiety is that you know, if Trump is reelected, um, what's to stop him from changing the terms with the Aussies on the AUKUS deal, right? <laughs> right now, mm -hmm. it is a cooperative defense industrial partnership. The United States is going to be selling Virginia-class submarines to Australia. Uh, Trump could take a page out of the South Korean cost-sharing talks and simply slap on a multiple billion dollar figure on top of the cost of the Virginia class submarines for the Aussies, right? That's just one example. So I think mm -hmm. that anxiety does exist. It's something that allies can't control, right? The thing that I've kind of been telling, you know, folks in allied governments largely is like, you know, focus on the things you can control because you cannot control how a, f a second Trump term is likely to affect your country. You can't hedge against it. Uh, and so also, I think the confidence that's sort of built up after having dealt with the first Trump administration, I think maybe helps in that regard, because I think mm -hmm. the allies understand that Trump responds well to personal flattery, uh, you know, letting him win at golf, um, probably a good thing for some Asian uh, national leaders to start uh, improving their golf game, but not too much because uh, you can't beat <laughs> Trump at golf. But uh, certainly, you know, having that personal relationship with the president did seem to matter quite a bit, right? I think um, the late uh, Shinzo Abe in Japan, I think, was a really good example of that. Uh, Abe, of course, rushes to New York with a gold golf club in November mm -hmm. 2016 after Trump wins, makes sure that he's one of the first leaders to show up uh, at the White House and then at Mar-a-Lago in early 2017. So I expect we'll see a similar dynamic. Uh, but I think there will be fundamentally still be anxiety, just given uh, the fact that 
this time a Trump administration is substantially less likely to be bounded. Uh, and, you know, we can we can talk a bit about the Vance, uh, the J.D. Vance vice presidential pick. You know, vice presidents, of course, matter at the margins in terms of internal administra- uh, administration debates and deliberations on foreign policy questions. So probably not best to overread Vance's role within a second Trump administration. But given what he represents in terms of uh, a clear shift away from the more Reaganite internationalist uh, foreign mm-hmm. policy thought of the uh, of the Republican Party, right, in a way that you know Mike Pence was not in the uh, in the first Trump administration, I think that too sends a message to allies that a second Trump administration might substantially manifest in a sharper turn in U.S. foreign policy. But uh, you know, Katie, what's your um, you know, just kind of looking at uh, the other parts of Asia that we haven't really talked about too much, you know, Southeast Asia, Oceania, Central Asia, even South Asia. Um, what are kind of your expectations for how the stakes in this election, particularly on the on the Trump Vance side of things, uh, uh, look? Yeah, I mean, so to to go to my favorite place in the world, Central Asia, I was in Kyrgyzstan in June. So sort of before all of the craziness, when this really sort of looked like a rematch between Biden and Trump. And that's what we all expected. Um, obviously, people asked me uh, about the election and what I what I felt about it and what I was watching. Um, I, I, I get this. I got the sense um, it's sort of a spectacle, uh, for, certainly from the Central Asian perspective. Central Asian elections are, are not nearly as exciting as this. And so I think there there is a degree of spectacle in that. Um, there's always been a degree of sort of uh, appreciation for Donald Trump's flair. Uh, I think some of that rests in the, frankly, decent relationships he has with autocratic leaders um, and, and the the assumption uh, that he's not going to criticize them in the way and in the tone that that democratic administrations in their in their view do uh, criticize these governments. Um, but that said, I, I don't know that that a second Trump administration would pay any more attention to Central Asia than the first Trump administration did. I think there's maybe more uh, in-depth conversation we can have about Oceania uh, when it comes to um, China in the Pacific, and sort of U.S. efforts to represent itself in the Pacific as a reliable partner, uh, it it will get interesting uh, because you know um, the Marshall Islands are not a country that Donald Trump can demand five billion dollars from the way he can demand it from South Korea, um, and and they have other options uh, readily available in China. And so I think it will be interesting to see if there's continuity in the Trump perspective on China. Uh, and the reason that I have some question about that is because Donald Trump does tend to flip his opinion very quickly sometimes. Uh, I think uh, it might be sort of a, it's not the perfect example, but the TikTok ban in the United States is an interesting case study in, in Donald Trump being really for it and then now being really against it. Uh, and and that it's it, the opinion, the opinion that he is putting forward is not necessarily rooted in real like ideological clay. It's not very deeply rooted. It's opportunistic. And so I think that, creates uh, opportunities for some countries if they can kind of present themselves as a good opportunity to get Donald Trump and his his administration something that they want. Uh, but, but it is transactional. And I think that that's a degree of some of these countries are seeking stability in these relationships. And, and so that transactional style is not necessarily going to get him very far. Uh, I am curious what you sort of think on the on the China question. You know, do you mm-hmm. expect Donald Trump to remain a China hawk? Or could you uh, is it reasonable to foresee the kind of better relationship that he has with like Vladimir Putin emerging uh, there too? Yeah, so I think you know that's that's a really good question. I would say the sense I have from traveling to China recently and talking to many Chinese observers of the United States is that um, you know no matter what happens in this election, U.S. China strategic competition will persist. It's really going to be the flavor of that competition. Um, mm-hmm. You know, in the scenario where you know a Trump Vance um, White House is able to force Ukraine and Russia to reach some kind of war terminating agreement, even if it's a frozen conflict, I think the concern then is that the United States will be able to actually pivot its attention towards uh, Asia in a way that is likely not to be to China's benefit. Uh, I think we also saw towards the end of the first Trump administration that Chinese leadership, I I think, had real concerns that the United States might be setting 
I mean, I don't think this was based in any reality, but there was a concern that the U.S. might actually do something that could precipitate a conflict or a war uh, with China. So, you know, um, the former mm -hmm. chairman of the Joint Chiefs, uh, General Milley, had to call his Chinese counterpart to sort of offer reassurances that this just wasn't what the United States was doing. So, you know, I think I think those anxieties would persist. I think Taiwan um, anxieties with both kind of uh, a Harris presidency and a Trump presidency there. But I would say, you know, with Trump specifically, given his willingness to kind of cast aside long-standing shibboleths in foreign policy or, or, or precedents, I think China might be a little bit more concerned that Trump could do something dramatic like authorize American weapon deployments to Taiwan or something that could really spark a crisis or a conflict between the two countries. Um, no direct talk of that, uh, you know, in uh, in the platform. Uh, really, the framing of competition with China, I think, will persist. But I think that's kind of um, the top line uh, concern. What's also interesting with Trump is that, you know, the character of U.S.-China economic competition would change, right? Democrats have been focused a lot on de-risking and, uh, and supply chain resilience and diversification, but less so on uh, or less obsessed with tariffs. I think Trump continues to indicate that if he is reelected, uh, tariffs are going to be a preferred tool once again for managing um, geoeconomic disagreements with allies and adversaries alike, right? It's not just going to be China, mm -hmm. but it will especially affect China uh, in that uh, in that sense, I think. Um, maybe we can close out a bit by talking about India, because I think it's actually a really interesting case here, right? I think, um, yeah. you know, the thought that I had about India, and I think this is really based on some of the writing that's been coming out from Indian commentators about the stakes in this U.S. election, is that, I mean, on some level, I think the Indians are looking to make lemonade no matter who's elected in the United States, right? So there are, I think, things that India might not enjoy under a Harris administration and under a Trump administration. But the broader U.S.-India strategic partnership, I think, is likely to persist in some version. What's really interesting, I think, is the sense in some parts of India that a Trump fans ticket is, is significantly likely to take um, pressure off of Russia, which is likely to then benefit um, benefit India, right? I think some people have also cited things like, uh, you know, J.D. Vance being critical of the U.S., um, potentially threatening sanctions on India for India purchasing uh, the S-400 surface-to-air uh, surface missile system from Russia. Uh, this was a few years ago. Um, and, uh, you know, Vance has talked about India being one of the most important U.S. allies in the region, not literally true in the treaty ally sense, but certainly, I think, expresses a, uh, a sense of uh, closeness there. And then on the flip side, I think um, the concern that I think is sort of uh, fester during the Biden administration uh, is the growing concerns uh, among among Democrats in particular about the changing character of India uh, politically. Right. So more concerns about human rights, about um, democratic regression in India. So those concerns would likely continue to persist under a Harris administration, uh, potentially ser uh, serving as an irritant for the U.S. India relationship. But, you know, beyond that, you know, I think at the working level, a lot of the stuff that has sort of proceeded over the last few years that had survived from the Trump administration to the Biden administration, I think a lot of that is likely to remain on track, regardless of the election outcome. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's an entirely reasonable uh, view on how India looks at at this election, because you're right, there are, there are these sort of through lines that regardless of which uh, candidate becomes president next, uh, there are there are drivers for the India-US relationship that sort of exist beyond the domestic politics of the United States. But I do think the Russia piece is really interesting uh, and, and something worth watching is as this campaign gets underway and as there, I don't know if there's going to be another debate. We'll see. Um, I, I, the last I had read, Donald Trump didn't want to debate Kamala Harris. So we'll, we'll see if there's another opportunity for the, the two candidates to face off and perhaps a I answer questions about what their foreign policy um, ideas will be, because I think we don't really have a great sense quite yet. I think we have the obviously we have the Republican Party's platform and we'll have the Democratic parties after their convention uh, in a couple of weeks. But uh, until then, we don't really we're kind of going off of of. Uh, I hate to say it, but vibes. We're mm -hmm. going off our assumptions. Everything about is what vibes we, these days. Everything's vibes these days. It's an election. <laughs> um, I think that's the other sort of interesting thing. One, one more note about Central Asia is that it's sort of, 
I, I, I would be confronted with people who assume that Donald Trump is going to win. They, they are 100 percent certain about it. Um, and I say, well, if you look at the polls, it's kind of 50 50. And so my answer is it's 50 50. We don't know until Election Day. Um, and that remains true in the United States. We don't know till Election Day. So it'll be worth watching uh, for certain. Yeah, absolutely. No, I mean, this is certainly not going to be the last podcast we do this year on the 2024 U.S. election. Certainly a lot of relevance across the region. Uh, you know, maybe we can come back and do uh, dedicated uh, episodes on uh, specific specific uh, Asian subregions uh, and the stakes of the U.S. election. I think that'd be an interesting way to kind of delve into uh, the two parties and their differences on foreign policy. But I guess, you know, I mean, the other thing to say is that um, you know, this is not this is largely speaking, not going to be an election about American foreign policy, uh, with perhaps the exception being uh, certain turnout dynamics relating to the Israel Gaza war. But, mm -hmm. you know, Asian geopolitics, I don't think are really going to be at the top of the minds of uh, American voters, but uh, they'll certainly be on the top of the mind for us. So we will be uh, back to talk about it. Yes, indeed. Well, thank you very much for listening uh, to this episode of the Asia Geopolitics Podcast. We'll be back soon with more. Uh, if you have an opportunity, please like us, leave a review, recommend us to a friend. And as always, you are welcome to get in touch with Ankit or I with ideas for future episodes. We'll be back soon.